Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew. And we are in the middle of our series on the Ten Commandments, and we've come to Thou Shalt Not Steal. There is a presupposition under this that there is such a thing as property. Um, we will talk a little bit about what happens if you deny that presupposition later, but we're going to start with what happens if you take that presupposition too far. I consider myself an economic libertarian in many ways, um, but I do not consider myself a philosophical libertarian. A lot of people in defining libertarianism will go to the non-aggression principle, which is basically you can do whatever you want as long as you're not committing aggression, you're not infringing on someone else's rights. Which is, you know, to an extent, fine. It's a helpful guideline in a lot of ways. Um, but there's actually something underneath the surface in that, in the philosophical underpinnings of libertarianism, that we want to address. Um, what would that be, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> There's an underhand pitch for you. Sorry, that, that's a really that, that lame was, question. You know, it's a nice lob, and I was looking the other way when you threw it. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, it was just the sun was in your mouth, and the, there was a hole in your eyes. And the grass, <laughs> I'm going to say the grass got in my eyes. Uh, libertarianism is not my playing field. I don't play well with libertarians for a number of reasons. Now, it's not because I believe in socialism, and we're going to address that someplace along the line too. Uh, let, me, let me read something from Ayn Rand, and maybe this will put things in focus. She writes, to hold one's own life as one's ultimate value and one's own happiness as one's highest purpose are two aspects of the same achievement from the Objectivist Ethics, published in 1964. And let me contrast that with a line that comes up a number of times in John Calvin's The Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is simply, we are not our own. Ayn Rand starts with, I own myself, and my happiness is the most important thing to me. And that there is nothing in any objective sense wrong with this. In fact, somehow, apparently, marvelously, if we all believe this at the same time and all pursue our own happiness, our own chief end, then somehow that's going to work out and it's going to make everybody happy and everybody will get along. And at which point at some place in there, I guess you insert uh, the non-aggression principle, which to me sounds amazingly like something out of Immanuel Kant. Hmm. Um, but that's, that's something else. Well, it's kind of a, a caveat, isn't it? It's a, a walking contradiction, if you will, to this idea of self-ownership. If your self-ownership is absolute, then there's really no limits on, you know, well, so-and-so's donut over there would make me really happy. You know, but why, we have why, the non-aggression principle to stop me from taking his donut, even though I own myself and should really be pursuing my own happiness. And my own happiness really does, it is wrapped up in that donut, trust me. I'm, I, I need to have it, and I don't And I'm see... the ultimate determinator of my own happiness. Yes, and yeah. my happiness will certainly make you happy. See this uh, nine millimeter? If you want to make me happy, don't get, hand over the donut now. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the shallowness of the thinking here is amazing. But let's, let's just look at what she, Ayn Rand, is saying. I am my own. I own myself. And she's by no means alone. Um, let's see if I have. I am looking for, where is it? I think I have Murray Rothbard's quote on this, which I have now apparently lost, but it's very much, oh, here it is. Yeah, every man, I am my own, every man's absolute right of self ownership, and so on. A comment, it's a thing that comes up because the assumption is, well, well where else am I going to start but from me? To which Christianity replies, you're going to start with God. Mm -hmm. Because God made you. God owns you. Uh, God has set all the parameters of your life. You, do, you don't make your heart beat. You don't make your brainwaves function. You don't make your neurons fire. You did not write your DNA. You did not determine who your parents would be, what era, what year, what year or month or day you would be born into. 
there's very little about your time and space that you have any control over in any way. You are someone else's property. You're in someone else's role-playing game, someone else's experiment, someone else's kingdom. And the claims you have on anything are massively insignificant. Uh, Lewis captures the spirit of this in the Screwtape Letters. And I, I think he does so well. I think I want to read a little bit of this and hope we don't get sued for it. Uh, this Screwtape is, uh, is a demon writing to his nephew, another demon, about how humans perceive ownership. He writes, you must therefore zealously guard in his mind, the human's mind, the curious assumption, my time is my own. Let him have the feeling that he starts each day as the lawful possessor of 24 hours. Let him feel as a grievous tax that portion of this property which he has to make over to his employers uh, and as a generous donation that further portion which he allows to religious duties. But what he must never be permitted to doubt is the total from which these deductions have been made was in some mysterious sense his own personal birthright. You have here a delicate task. The assumption which you want him to go on making is so absurd that if once it's questioned, even we, hell, cannot find a shred of argument in its defense. The man can neither make nor retain one moment of time. It all comes to him by pure gift. He might as well regard the sun and moon as his chattels. He is also, in theory, committed to total service to God. And let me skip along here. The humans are always putting up claims to ownership, which sound equally funny in heaven and in hell. And we must keep them doing so. Much of the modern resistance to chastity comes from man's belief that they own their bodies. Those vast and perilous estates pulsating with the energy that made the worlds in which they find themselves without their consent, <laughs> and from which they are ejected with the pleasure of another. It is as if a royal child whom his father has placed for love's sake in titular command of some great province under the real rule of wise counselors should come to fancy that he really owns the cities, the forest, the corn, in the same way that he owns the bricks on the nursery floor. We produce this sense of ownership not only by pride, but by confusion. We teach them not to notice the different senses of the possessive pronoun, the finely graded differences that run from my boots through my dog, my servant, my wife, my father, my master, and my country to my God. They can be taught to reduce all these senses to that of the boots, the my of ownership. Even in the nursery, a child can be taught to mean by my teddy bear, not the old imagined recipient of affection, to whom it stands in a special relationship, but the bear that I can pull to pieces if I like, and so on. Words my and mine, my hand, my heart, my brain, and yet my soul. How much control do I have over any of these? I didn't make them. I can't control them. I do not decide their ultimate destiny. And to say, to base an entire philosophy of life and existence and a whole economic system on top of that gets about as silly as anything possibly can. Can you clarify what you mean by I can't control these things? Because there is a sense in which you govern your, your body. You know, you choose to pick up your cup of tea and whatnot. Uh, yes. How about one word? COVID. <laughs> Palsy. Cancer. Cancer. Nervous prostration. Heart attack. Stroke. Allergic reaction. We, we like to say that because 99 times out of 100, I can pick up my coffee. That therefore, I can do it any time I want. How about the guy with the gun saying, give me your money? Are you going to? No, I'm going to drink my coffee now. Thank you. For <laughs> okay, that ended that real fast. Uh, we, we are always at the mercy and it, it, even the word mercy. I mean, mercy is personal. There are things around us from that from a secular point of view, from a materialistic point of view, have no mercy. They just happen. They just are. Disease being uh, one obvious thing, but all kinds of things that we, we list as accidents, cellular degeneration, things that happen on the subatomic level that alter who and what we are. And then, of course, back to the, the more basic question. So free will, really, where'd that come from? <laughs> Is not your drinking coffee simply a, a manifestation of a chemical addiction that's rooted in repeated uses of one chemical by another set of chemicals 
operating in the midst of matter in motion? Who are you anyway? And what is it? What is this coffee thing you speak of? Where the 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 total assumptions and presuppositions here are enormous. And yet Ayn Rand and her crew often just blow them by as well. It's obvious. It's this is the way people live. Yes, it is. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Why but, might that be? <laughs> why might that be? Why might people live as if freedom and responsibility are real things when there is no outward explanation or assurance that they should be such? And so that's when we as Christians stand up and say, you are not your own. You belong to the God who made you, the God whose providence totally enfolds and controls and directs you, and to whom you are completely accountable. And yes, your freedom and responsibility are a real thing within the realms of your creaturehood. Uh, and none of this constitutes self-ownership in any ultimate sense. Personal responsibility, sure, absolutely. Defined by God in his word not in some vague, uh, non-defined natural law, but in Holy Scripture. And so as we, as we come to this libertarian approach, they, they start with, well, I own myself, and therefore I have the right to the property that I need to, and we keep going, right, wait, rights and right. Where are these words coming from? What is a right? What is, what is the right to life, liberty, and property? Who, who defined these rights? Well, they're, they're the, uh, the obvious unfolding of my first presupposition. No, they're not. <laughs> and your first presupposition is stupid and undefendable. The fact that, as you already pointed out, Emily, once we assume I, I live for myself, I live for myself, I die for myself, give me the donut or I'll blow you away. I mean, it's that simple. It, you put two gods in the same room, one of them is going down, <laughs> which is the history of humanity. <laughs> And you cannot say, well, if they both understood what it means to own oneself properly. No, they are owning themselves on their own terms. Well, you are know, you... if the other guy would just share his donut. Yeah. You know, everything would be fine. Re what we really need to do is do away with the property. Property is just an illusion. Yeah. Well, then but that's jumping ahead. We'll get that's to that jumping later. ahead where, where we will most certainly jump. Uh, but the, the assumption here of some kind of absolute that's, that's a, it's a shady thing in the background that we can kind of backhandedly appeal to, this idea that I have rights or that you're right to do this, he's wrong to do this. One moment while I read again from my hand. If man is to live on earth, it is, his, it is right for him to use his mind. It is right to act on his own free judgment. And it is right to work for his values and to keep the product of his work. If life on earth is his purpose, he has a right to live as a rational being. Nature forbids him the irrational. Oh, wow. How many religious assumptions did you count in that? <laughs> and it's all conditioned upon one little word. If. She's not asserting. Well, not directly. But she says, if this... Well, man does not have to live upon earth. I don't need anybody. I can kill you all and I can be quite happy. No, you wouldn't. I think I would and who are you to judge me? But getting past that, if, if man is to live on earth, it's right for him to use his mind. Well, what does right, and she italicizes it, what does right mean here? Necessary, proper, logical, best course of action, what most people would think of doing. If There's an is, unquestioned or an unanswered question underneath each of those suggestions. Why would that be the way to choose what to do? Yeah. It is right for him to act on his own free judgment. Um, how about I, I let someone else make all the decisions for me as long as they give me lots of stuff and I don't have to work? In fact, I'll go in the back room and, and um, snort, um, what's a drug of choice? Cocaine. Cocaine. All day long. And play video games. And they'll be really weird playing video games when I'm that high. As long as I get my little coupon that gives me food and someone's paying the rent on this place, I'm perfectly happy. And the response is, well, you shouldn't be. Shouldn't. What is this word you are using here? Well, you know, what? food and housing and healthcare are all human rights. So even yeah. if you're doing those things, you're entitled to. Yeah. Um, it's right for him. It is right to work for his values. Wait, <laughs> his values, um, my values and my neighbors may not be the same. So who wins here and on what, by what standard and to keep the product of his work? 
Why? If life on Earth is his purpose, he has a right to live as a rational being. That's the assumption that somehow the universe is rational, which again is a huge, huge assumption. But I love the last line. Nature forbids him the irrational. When did nature become God? Apparently it is, whatever nature means here, his own nature, the way the world works, however she's using it here. Forbid, it, it's contrary to the way I am. It's contrary to my chemical structure to seek the irrational. Boy, there are a lot of people living irrationally these days. I wonder why that is. Are they wrong to do that? Is it just some flaw in their reasoning? Then how do we know that rationality is better than irrationality since so many people seem to favor irrationality? This, this whole thing is sinking sand. There's no firm place to stand. And, um, and, and yet that ultimately is the best that uh, libertarianism can give us. Let me read a paragraph of mine. But Rand's pronouncements are unfounded and in that sense blatantly religious. What if a man is quite content to live as a thug, a parasite, or a beast? What if a man prefers the life of the indolent, state-supported poor to that of the highly pressured but moderately successful middle class? What if a man honestly prefers narcotic delirium to eight hours plus of mental discipline and exertion? It won't do for libertarians to say, well, he shouldn't unless libertarianism wants to become a prescriptive and authoritative religion, authoritarian religion. Men value what they value, and there's no accounting for taste. There is, however, the reality of sin. So as we approach this idea of property, we, we, we've dealt with this, I think, sufficiently at this point. And I'm sure people will point at fingers and say, "Which no, you're misinterpreting, or no, you're not understanding. I think we're understanding quite fine. Because remember, I, I don't think Rand is necessarily the best libertarianism <laughs> has to offer, however. Yeah. No, I don't yeah. think so either. I think that, that's a valid criticism, and yet she's probably the most popular. And we have to distinguish between a lot of different wings. Um, like, as I said, you know, short, shorthand is what these labels are. Libertarian can be shorthand for, I believe, in laissez faire economics as far yeah. as it goes. I believe in, you know, Austrian economics. I believe in this or that. And I think there are valid ways in which to consider oneself libertarian that do not entail attaching oneself to the philosophy of Ayn Rand. Yeah. Well, if, we're, if, if you're just like, sorry, because uh, some of what you're saying, I consider myself as more of a broad libertarian than Emily would. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting here going, yeah, but again, this is Rand, and I like no one I talk to who's a libertarian online likes Rand. Uh, <laughs> but well, she they, has to have credit for being like the seminal artist of libertarianism. Absolutely. Seminal yeah. artist? <laughs> she, 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 she got she, attention for the movement. You, you got to give her that. Uh, she, she, well, she, there is that. She, she brought it mainstream. She gave it a public face. She, she's the novelist, and the novelist gave birth to at least one movie. This is where where people get a lot of this, at least the starting point. Yeah. Now you can well, appeal. If you're, if, I'll just say if you're everything that you said, like if you're just mocking Rand, I'm on board. <laughs> uh, and well, even if you're uh, being critical of like uh, hard libertarian right, the bottom right corner of the political pyramid, <laughs> uh, anarcho capitalism, also on board. <laughs> Well, the question becomes, uh, how do you rescue this? Well, mm -hmm. you don't. You can start over. The problem is names. Libertarianism. Mm -hmm. I don't know who first used the word. I don't know who has the right to use it. I don't know who is able legitimately to say, no, they're not, but I am. I really don't know. I haven't, I haven't pursued that, and, and I'm not inclined to, but maybe somebody else out there will, or maybe one of you two can. I'm sure you get a lot of different answers, yeah. <laughs> depending on where you look. And, and sometimes that's that's a problem. Somebody at some point mm -hmm. needs to say, this is libertarianism. This is essential. If, if you want to change any of these assumptions, then you need to create a different name or at least say libertarianism sub two. <laughs> um, so that we can clearly distinguish, because right now we are dealing with atheistic libertarianism. You say, no, no, no. We believe in theistic libertarianism. Okay, now let's define theism. Is that Trinitarian Christianity revealed in scripture? Or is it some sort of deism or pantheism or Unitarianism 
or a God we're not sure. Is it Kant's God hiding in the noumenal? What what is this theos thing, and what kind of truth does he, she, or it give us as a foundation? How is it given, and is it requirement or is it suggestion? Is it perceived by reason, by by intuition and emotion, or by divine revelation? Uh, it, it's one thing to say, no, I'm not like her. I'm better. But and and I grant I I, have, I don't know very many people who call themselves libertarians who would follow Ayn Rand into her atheism. But you're still using the word, so something here. If all you're saying is I believe in liberty, we got a lot of good words for that one, and you use some of them earlier. We can talk of laissez faire. We can talk of capitalism, a free market economy, Austrian economics, and other things that are a little more specific or maybe a little more vague, depending. But at some point, and this is what we are talking about, because this is what we always talk about. We're talking about theological foundations. We can try to come up with an economic system we like and then, then that we think works. And then we can shop around for a theological basis and hope we can find one or try to graft it onto a system that already exists. Like, I got this great system. I bet it would fit into Christianity. No, no. Maybe into <laughs> Islam. No, Judy, modern Judy, it's a... There, that liberal Judaism, it'll fit right there nicely. Okay, well, that's one way of doing things. I do know people have constructed their, their world and life view that way. Or we can start with who God is, and we can see what that means for concepts of property. And then along the way, not be terribly surprised if some smart people, and it's occasionally some dumb people, have come up with ideas that parallel or intersect with what we find because we all live in a real world. We all buy and sell. And sooner or later, we're going to notice some things because God faithfully runs his universe. And we're going to find out that, say, using bark for money doesn't work. Uh, that, bar that using some kind of commodity money is better than using fiat money. We, we can see this, we can see the repercussions, but we're, we're, we're left out there grabbing this and grabbing that and trying to weave them into a system and yet proclaiming that uh, this, this is liberty. But we don't know why these things are so. We just have experienced them. And so far we're right, maybe, but it's not enough. And it really doesn't answer all the questions where hopefully, both as Christians and as human beings, we want something that holds together. And as Christians, we begin where we always begin, not even with creation, but within the doctrine of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, I'll ask, and did, did either of you want to comment on what I just said before I go off on another direction? I guess the, something came to mind, and I can't remember exactly what sentence you said <laughs> that that triggered it. But essentially, whatever you were expressing was, you know, the accuracy of terms as mm -hmm. far as what they what belief they're describing. That also applies, yeah. not just to what we're talking about now, but also to conservatism, yes. and republicanism, Absolutely. or Democrat mm -hmm. Tickness, um, <laughs> liberalism, or sure. Absolutely. Christianity. Yeah. yeah. I was saying actually, actually, Christianity yeah. was in my mind as I was saying that, mm -hmm. because sometimes we don't define Christianity very well. And it's very possible, especially in these things that, you know, there isn't an authoritative definition of libertarianism, because libertarians wouldn't like an authoritative definition. Of that, <laughs> that would just be contrary. You got a problem there. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it's, it's, well, it's, no, not. No, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's possible to even disagree on whether the term is appropriately applied in a certain case. Sure, absolutely. And yet to agree on fundamentals of policy and theory. Yeah, you, you, it, it's possible for, I mean, honestly, you, you're, you're walking down a busy street, say in New York, and you see a motorcycle creening around, and it strikes someone, knocks him down, and goes on its merry way, and you and five other people rush over, and you see this old guy bleeding eyes unresponsive, pupils dilated, and you all jump into action. One guy pulls out a cell phone and goes 911. Another says, I know CPR. Another backs the crowds off. Another one stops the, you know, and, and, they, and you're all pulling together 
And when all is said and done, you save the guy's life. And afterwards you say, hi, who are you? Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm Bob and I'm Jewish. I'm Frank and I'm a Mormon. I'm a uh, Mao and I'm a communist. You know, you go through the list and at that point, everybody saw something that resonated with, in terms of their worldview and for, and for good reasons, because worldviews that don't take humanity seriously on some level don't get anywhere. <laughs> um, and that moment, those all those things move you to do this one objectively good thing. And we find out that maybe maybe Pete's a Christian, uh, an evangelical Christian. And Sam's a Roman Catholic, also a Christian from his perspective. Shall we say, no, well, then they never could have worked together. No, they, they could work together. But when they say, hey, we made such a great team, let's create the Justice League of New York and patrol the streets <laughs> helping people. That's probably not going to work very well. Uh, they will and, and all they, have different ideas of justice. <laughs> they will. And and so here is is it all right for people who call themselves libertarians, a hyphenated libertarianism, <laughs> to say, well, we all agree on this. Of course it is. You could do that. And in fact, you probably should do that. But when you start writing at large, you probably should say, I'm a libertarian, and my take on libertarianism is, as opposed to his or hers or theirs, so that you are very clearly presenting your own case. And if you want to have someone else on your side and include their name with yours, you better go talk to them mm -hmm. and make sure you actually are on the same page. And you better, or create the club or the league or the group or the movement or the manifesto that you all sign. Or it, yeah, it does get very confusing, and, and we start throwing accusations at, well, no, libertarians don't believe that. I just talked to five today, and they all did. Well, but they're not really libertarians. Well, tell them that then, please. I'm the guy on the outside trying to make sense of this. They're using the name. You don't like it. You're, you, you, you talk with them, not with me. And we do need yeah. to be clear that, about that's another. Things. That's another part of the problem in, in that particular movement, too, is... Um, and I'm, again, saying this as someone who is quite all right saying I'm a libertarian, is you've got a, a fairly hefty chunk, especially in the libertarian party, which is an oxymoron in the first place, um, <laughs> who are like, libertarianism means pro-choice. And if, if you take the non-aggression principle as the you know, founding block of what li it means to be libertarian – you are in the act of, of, of abortion aggressing against yes. someone who has done nothing against you. And that is fundamentally at odds with exactly what you're claiming to be in the first place. <laughs> but that's only if the unborn baby's a person. Yeah. And that's the other part of the problem. Yeah. And so back to theological definitions. Yeah. Who decides? And why do we let them? <laughs> All right, we should pivot to yes the commandment and the implications for property. Wait, we're talking from about the commandments in this podcast? Yeah, okay. <laughs> do, do libertarians allow that? Well, socialists don't, unless it's come from the state. Um, but we'll get to them in a minute. <laughs> the The origin of property. Lewis, I think, hits it when he says the word "my mine." Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Where does this my mind thing come from? It comes from the Trinity itself. The father looks at the son and says, my son. The son looks at the father and says, my father. They both look and say, my spirit. Now, that relationship is eternal and it's unique. And when God created, but it, it existed. In fact, Proverbs 8, uh, wisdom, who's the eternal logos, who's the son, says, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Possession. Is it all right to talk like that? Yes, it, there is a sort of ownership, but you have to specify because we get afraid. Okay, that, that, that's leading toward chattel slavery. No, it just means that my and mine have various meanings. As Lewis says, my dog, my boots, my wife, my God. Same word doesn't mean the same thing in all of those uses. And when God created heaven and earth, the my and mine exchange between the persons of the Trinity was not the same my and mine that they now apply to creation. 
uh, when the, the father and the son say my to one another, that is the my of complete equality, because they are one God, one essence, of perfect transcend or, um, transparency, communion, sharing, ultimate complete love. Uh, each one really does have the interest of the other at heart, because they're in each other, the doctrine of perichoresis. The Father in the Son, the Son in the Father. They both breathe to each other the Holy Spirit. But creation is something else. And when they say mind to creation, that really is ownership. That's the ownership of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, he, God, by creating the world, did not make the world God. And when God owns the world, when the cattle on a thousand hills are his, when the heaven of heavens is the Lord's, then that's not the same kind of my and mine. And when God creates humanity, and says, my child, my friend, my servant, my people. That's different from when God says, my planet, or my rocks, or my grass. There are different kinds of my and mine. So how do we distinguish them from Scripture? What does the law of God say as to how we are to regard God, my God, my wife, my children, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my neighbor, my enemy, my dog? my house, my backyard, my garden, uh, my words, intellectual property. The Bible has a place for all of these, and they're rooted in the original ability of the Father and Son to say to one another, mine. And if God so made the world that it's all his, then he, by nature of who he is, is exactly what Ayn Rand wants for humanity. God really can say, I own myself. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because he's infinite, he's transcended, he exists necessarily, he does not need anything from his creation, he did not have to create. He's completely self-sufficient. And that has uh, implications for the atonement even, where Jesus lays down his own life and has the authority to do so. Has the authority to do so, yeah. So on that basis then, we can come to creation and we can say, God has given to mankind generally and to individual men this thing we call property. And he backs this up by these things called commandments. And we are on, I can never remember the number. This is the eighth, eighth. commandment, right? Yeah. <laughs> I always confuse the seventh and eighth. Um, thou shalt not steal. Well, if it's possible for me to steal, it must mean that somebody has something that's theirs and not mine. And that God regards it as theirs and not mine. And and therefore, I should not take it. And there are eternal consequences if I do. It's not a guideline. <laughs> it is an authoritative law from heaven, from Mount Sinai, recorded in Scripture and buttressed by a ton of case laws, proverbs, prophetic sermons, the Sermon on the Mount, Pauline epistles, and so on, that help us put a fine point on it and see under what circumstances I should not take that thing that's over there that may or may not in my mind belong to someone else. The Bible helps me understand when I can do that. Governments have a right to tax. The Bible says so. To what extent? Well, it sets tyranny someplace around. If you're taking more than 10% of someone's income, you're a tyrant. That's a different road on itself. But you know, the Bible does speak to such things. The church is entitled to 10%, the tithe, which is why the state isn't, by the way. <laughs> um, you are your your parents have a claim on your money when they grow old because you had a claim on their money when you were a little baby. These these are real legitimate claims. You know, I'm not going to let that baby steal my money that I had set aside for a trip to Hawaii. No, God says you actually have an obligation here, and these things are established by God in His Word, and they're they're in writing. They're clear. They're not a matter for debate or hypothesis. Now we can debate fine points where where Christians have not done a great job of exegesis because we've ignored particular topics for a couple thousand years. But the broad outlines are pretty plain, which is why people hate Christianity. It's not because Christianity is clear. It's because it's way too clear. Uh, I, I wonder what – this will be getting off topic, but I we can cut it out. wonder what topics you're thinking of when you say we haven't been real too good at it for 2,000 years. Um. Just as an example, I'm curious. Well, I'll give you one. I'll give you one that I think, in my mind, is very clear. But I brought this up uh, in a Sunday school lesson once and got immediate pushback from someone who I highly respect and who I never thought would have pushed back on it. So I, I'm still 
uh, a year or two later, I'm still sort of, what just happened? I was talking about, uh, speaking against the, the principle of eminent domain, where the state can mm -hmm. simply come in and take stuff because society Nobody's saved. using it. Yeah, <laughs> well, someone is using it, but the, but the society as a whole needs it more. And I was being pretty, pretty blunt about it. And one gentleman raised his hand and said, but you're not saying that if some people settle over here in this area and more and more people are coming and suddenly they find out that the, that the water needed to support this community can't be got there, but needs to be channeled right through your land. You're not saying that, we, that the state doesn't have a right to take your land and channel the water, are you? Well, one, yes, I am, actually. <laughs> But, uh, and, and, and so as not to, uh, out of respect for the gentleman who said this, because I do really respect him, I said, look, I don't have all the answers, but what I am saying is that the Bible tells us that I can't take someone else's stuff, not even using the state as my instrument, unless the Bible says it can. So if you can find some place in the Bible that says that that's allowable, okay, I don't know, I don't know all that's in the Bible, so maybe I missed something. So you would need to show me that. But the Bible sets the, wherever these limits are, that would be one the Bible has to set. As I say, I thought that was pretty straightforward, but maybe people would disagree with me and in the name of Christianity. Yeah. In that example, um, you know, there, I don't want to, you know, linger too much, um, but there's an assumption that the government is responsible for supplying water, which mm -hmm. is where people will call me a crazy extreme libertarian because I'm like, Mm, I I don't really think that's the government's job. No, I don't know. Um, yeah. But it's an assumption. Um, no. And you, we can disagree about that or whatever, but we have to recognize that that is an assumption that was just made. Yeah. Right. And I will leave it at this because it is relevant to that particular point you were talking mm -hmm. about, which is that uh, when, when David was told to build an altar to the Lord at a specific place and there was a man's threshing floor there, he mm. paid the man for it. Yes, he did. Yeah. And he paid fair market value. And the man was he, willing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Who was the also, uh, the vineyard that Jezebel... And then there was that. The yeah. state wanted that. <laughs> and um, they at least didn't, didn't go for direct murder. They just murdered legally with a lot of lies and false testimony. Oof. Yeah, the Bible is... A, there's some passages in Ezekiel that speak of uh, Messiah's kingdom under the figure of the second temple. And um, I say, and, and, and the, the prince shall not take of his people's property to give to his servants. Mm. <laughs> In the ideal kingdom, that doesn't happen. Of course, way back, Samuel had said, you know what your king's going to be like when he becomes a tyrant? <laughs> He's going to take your property and give it to his servants. Uh, right. And so that, I think, we, 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 after bashing libertarianism, at least me bashing it, as I understand it and as I keep being shown what it is. Uh, and again, I'm not including anyone who calls themselves particularly um, free market capitalist, uh, laissez-faire economics, Austrian school of economics. Those are more specific economic philosophies that we can critique and we can, we can debate and can, can to some extent be rooted in different systems because of the nature of how they came to be. We can, we, can, we can clip out, say, Adam Smith's value theory of work and still appreciate the bulk of what he did and still yeah. call ourselves, you know, um, yes, Wealth of Nations is still worth reading. But I'm talking, I guess, is what you would call philosophical libertarianism. And so having dealt in some measure with that, we absolutely have to deal with what is by far the more dangerous thing in our day, and that's socialism. Mm -hmm. I... In teaching economics a couple of years ago, I I don't remember what the question was uh, that I gave my kids. It was just some kind of little quizzy thing just to see if they've been paying attention. And one young lady described the horrors of capitalism and how wonderful socialism was. It was not because she was a socialist. It, because she, it was because she did not know what the words meant. Mm -hmm. And I believe she was an 11th grader. Hmm. So shame on our school <laughs> and her parents and her for not knowing what these very important words actually mean. In fact, uh, the result of that has taken a while is I'm in my world history syllabus. I am adding an appendix on basic economics because I, I suddenly realize by the time I get to Greece and Rome, we're talking socialist reforms, left and right reforms. Mm -hmm. 
And if the kids come in, not for whatever reason, not knowing what socialism is, oh, these were reformers. That means they did good stuff. <laughs> because we're Protestants. We like the yeah. Reformation. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so when they canceled everybody's debt, when they taxed people to provide free food and circuses for everybody. Redistributed was, the land. Redistributed the land. Yeah. That, that, these must be the good guys. Like, okay, this, guy, this has got to change. So I'm still working on that. It's almost done. So Emily, or either one, Brian, both of you, in fact, or one of you, or both of you complimenting each other. How would you define socialism at the beginning of the 21st century? Hmm. See, it got real hard when you made it specific to the <laughs> beginning of the Fine. 21st century. <laughs> Since the Enlightenment, <laughs> there's a broad brush for you. Oh, no, no. See, you're just making it, <laughs> not making it easy on me. I, I mean, when I think about socialism in general as a philosophy, I think of the fundamental denial of this authority over property mm -hmm. um, or in common mm -hmm. parlance, property rights, that there's this idea, it's, it's almost even taking the idea of rights further than the American founders did, which, you know, I have my problems with the American founders and their conception of rights. But when you can say that anything is a right, you can say that everything is a right. There's not a foundation for it. That's my problem with the American founders, because it lets <laughs> FDR do whatever he wants, and I'm still bitter. Um, <laughs> Freedom from fear. <laughs> right. But socialism is fundamentally, to me, this idea that property is an illegitimate idea. And I think that takes a lot of different forms throughout history. And at the beginning of the 21st century, it's, well, how am I going to pay off my student loans? You know, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? These things which I have established as the norm of life that I deserve to have provided for me. Okay. Brian, do you want to add to that or tweak that? Uh, I'll just put it into much more complicated language, which is... <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's the uh, dialectical opposite of capitalism leading unto the synthesis resulting <laughs> in the communist utopia. <laughs> you just froze, Brian. Are you still with us? <laughs> oh, no. That was the worst time possible to freeze. <laughs> I think the word got out before you froze. Okay. Oh, yeah. Did all of that? Uh, it's on my recording, at least. So. Yeah. <laughs> the world will know what I said. You can't stop the signal. <laughs> Dialectical materialism. Um, yeah, as as we've said with regard to libertarianism, there are lots of variations and a lot of. Mm. I mean, national socialists are bad Nazis. <laughs> right. International socialists are good. Right? Because national socialists yeah. are right wing and dictatorial and nationalistic and about to destroy the world. Whereas international socialists love everybody. And let's not call them Marxists or communists anymore because that's so passe. We'll call them progressives and everything gets better. Because they're all about social reformation. And, you know, the <laughs> reformation, they're the good guys. Yeah. Yeah. We're back to that again. I have a. Uh, on my shelves, the history book that I used as a student in high school it wasn't it wasn't a Christian text. It wasn't bad. They tried to be nice. They tried to be fair with everybody. They were still in that moment where Hegelianism reigned to the Hegelianism and being a gentleman still reigned to the degree that we will try to explain Christianity as we think Christians would do. Now we'll do that with Islam. Now we'll do it with Buddhism. And so they tried not to slam anybody, but tried to as best they could. And sometimes they succeeded and sometimes not to try to explain things from the point of view of the person who actually held the belief, because from their point of view, all beliefs are equal and we want to be polite. Well, of course, now you don't do you simply go for the jugular on all the beliefs you don't share. The one exception, though, in the entire textbook I found was John Calvin. <laughs> they, ob they obviously had never read any primary sources, whatever, and they painted a record of Calvin that is unrecognizable to anyone who actually knows historical character. Anyway, I mean, that that's like when they try to paint uh, capitalism as something it's like, well, if uh, if you're poor, you're you were predestined to be poor and there's nothing you can do to fix it. So just deal with it. No, yeah. it's anyway, like that's I, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said that to say this. There is actually a section where they contrast Nazism and communism or fascism mm -hmm. and communism. Ah. 
And as you look at it, it amounts to not much of a difference in their own language. Like, okay, so the the communists tell us they want to take over the world, whereas the fascists are interested in the success of their own nation. <laughs> um, and the 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 fascist want to be sure that they have a say in what all industry and capitalist institutions do, whereas the communists simply take over and control it. And the fascists hate the communists, the communists hate the fascists. So there you go. That's that's the grand difference. That's a family quarrel. <laughs> socialism is socialism. And yes, there are a dozen different brands. There's Italian, there's German, there's FDR's brand, there's Julius Caesar's brand. You know, you can range back and forth in history and back across the face of the earth. So socialism, then, I think we agree, denies property rights and denies thou shalt not steal because it puts in place not only of the individual, but ultimately of God, an ultimate property right in the community, in the state, in the collective. Uh, the community together owns everything. And all individual claims over against that must be measured against the collective's greater claims. Sure, you can have your own toothbrush, because who wants it? But we may need your rocking chair, and we certainly might need your property to run a highway through it, and we might need the minerals under your house. And you, of course, will gladly surrender these because, well, they're not yours in the first place. They're ours. We all together own these things. Isn't love wonderful? It's an absolutizing of a particular concept of love that says we're all in this together. We all own everything together. We all share, and you will share, or you will be eliminated from the body. You will be reckoned the cancer you are and cut off. Mm. Now, of course, the real question behind this is who speaks for the collective? Mm. It can be a democracy, but even a democracy, as we can see by watching the media today, opinions can be manipulated by a select few. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's a hidden control behind uh, subtle influences, the voice of the press or whatever, or an open, we are the elite. We are the brain, you are the body. We will tell you what it means for you to be free. We are the educated members of the party. We are big brother and we love you. And we will tell you where in your freedom consists. We will tell you how things are going to be used. We are God walking on earth and you should love us for it because we love you so much. That's socialism. And it is fundamentally the same in every place, in every generation. Uh, it's what the Bible describes as the beast in Revelation, or at least the practical outworkings of that, where the state becomes God. And it doesn't matter how you structure it politically, whether it's feudal or an aristocracy, a monarchy, constitutional republic, a democracy, uh, dictatorial rule by a party or by one man, that's irrelevant. What matters is this concept that we together own everything, control everything, the way God does. And that if you are contrary to that, either you need to be adjusted to fit in or you need to be cut off. And if you are truly a child of love like we are, you will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. And lest you think we are painting a caricature, uh, allow me to recommend, this is not my official recommendation <laughs> that we will do at the end of the show, but Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago. Oh, my, yes. Um, this is not a sterile mistake. It is one that has blood on its hands um, oh, time and blood, time again. The blood of millions. Millions. Also, one day in the life of... Uh, Ivan Denisovich, yes. which is much shorter than the Gulag Archipelago, <laughs> uh, and gets to roughly the same kind of points, if a little bit less. Um, it shows less on an individual thing. scale. Yes, thank yeah. you. As opposed yeah. to the three volumes that encompass the whole system. <laughs> and I now know what book I'm going to recommend, but I got to go get it. But I'll, I'll come up with that in a second. Have we? Have we? Um, Okay, we have we have shown that Christianity is opposed to any kind. But did you see what we just did? Christianity is opposed to anything that says I, as an individual, 
am the voice the universe speaks. I am the sum and total of all things. My glory shines. And the collective, which may not actually be the voice of the collective, but maybe the voice of one man in the background, the man behind the curtain pulling strings. I am the sum total of the universe. I am that which is to be called. We together, we, all of us, what we've done is simply attack humanism mm -hmm. in the name of the Christian theism. There is one God, the triune God of Scripture, and his chief end is to glorify himself and enjoy himself forever. And we are invited in the gospel to share that glorious experience, adventure, truth. But we can't do it and hold on to our rights, either as an individual or as a collective. We have to surrender them all to Jesus. And the amazing thing is that when he, we do, we find a freedom we did not know before. And to the world, that sounds like nonsense. But <laughs> and yet it's guilt, played out in <laughs> yeah, history. Plays out again and again. Freedom from guilt, from sin, from our own passions and lusts, from our own wickedness, from our own desire to hurt, kill, and butcher one another in the name of love and peace. He sets us free from that to be productive, to sow and reap, to earn and save. Paul's, and we probably should not leave without this, Paul oh, yeah. in, in mm -hmm. Ephesians 4 sums up what thou shalt not steal means. He says, let him that stole steal no more, but, leather, but rather let him work with his hands the thing is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Notice the things involved here. First of all, the, the assumption is you're thieves. As human beings, we're thieves. We steal stuff. We steal stuff from work. We steal people's time. We steal their reputation. We steal all kinds of stuff. Stop it. Die in Christ. Surrender to Christ. But then there's a positive. That's putting off the old man, putting on the new man, but rather let him labor. So the alternative to stealing is working with your hands, and everybody works with their hands. The mind's included, obviously, because <laughs> if your hands aren't guided by your mind, it's going to be kind of weird. <laughs> but that means with your whole being, including your mm -hmm. physical image, whether you're pushing a pencil or typing on a computer screen, there's, there's going to be some hand labor as well as swinging a, a hammer or moving a saw, pulling, pulling a plow. So that he may, and the thing that's good, it needs to be a lawful occupation, not just something that makes you a lot of money. So that he may have, and we often jump over that, have. How do I have it? Because I didn't spend it on lame things right off the bat. I actually saved it. I didn't waste it on tripe. I didn't waste it on the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I saved it, why? To have to give to him that needs. Biblical charity. I work hard not only to meet my own needs and those of the family around me, but I save it to help people who have legitimate needs. But that's my call. I don't need a, a government bureaucracy to tell me that my neighbor needs a handout right now, or a hand, or help, or love. The people across the other way, well, they have neighbors over there. What if nobody, what if they have no neighbors? Well, first of all, that's probably their fault. But secondly, that's where the church comes in and the church begins to reach out as an organization, establishing, first working on its own, but two, establishing charitable organizations that, with that exact goal in mind. And it works amazingly well and did for a very, very long time until some American politician in the 1800s decided, oh, wait, if I get the government to do it, then I can use that as a good excuse for why, why people should elect me. Because if they elect me, I will share their money with people who really have needs and guarantee my yes. reelection. Uh, the only thing, the only thing I wanted to add to that is uh, basically that really the you, you you occasionally see it, especially these days, with um, very rich people who happen to be left leaning or or Democrats or whatever, uh, who are saying like, you know, they make videos and them talking very heartfelt into the camera, saying we need X no X candidate, insert name here to uh to get in so that you know you can increase my taxes really we want that we want to be able to pay for all these things and i, I always just wonder it's like what is stopping you now from right. paying for things that you want to get funded and i mean i'm pretty sure the government won't turn away a big check that you send to them yeah. and really all it is is um I heard I heard this phrase once as well when it, uh, in regards to gun rights, which was you know you don't need guns. The the police will help you out. Just call <laughs> the police; they'll they'll be the ones to help you. And it is the most ivory tower thing possible, especially to when you consider say, 
these are the same people who think we have a police brutality problem, which I'm not denying. But if we do, <laughs> why are we calling the police to solve our problems? Sorry, I interrupted. Please continue. That is okay. <laughs> and basically saying, you know, I whether, whether it's calling the police or having the IRS just take the money out and, and do with your money what they will through their various social programs, What either of those cases, it is an a tower so ivory that you can't look <laughs> at it in direct sunlight and the equivalent of just saying just have the maid do it right yeah yeah you know, you know. Mm. oh and thereby hangs an entire discussion of graduated income tax the communist manifesto and the various techniques and schemes that socialists have used in the west since the french revolution before what that brings us into conspiracy theory and that's far beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. For now, work <laughs> hard, save your money, help out people who really need it, and you will be doing the will of God. There you go. Amen to that. And the Thank heart of true so religion much. is this, to take care of widows and orphans in their affliction. Mm -hmm. Yep. To keep oneself unspotted from the world. Amen. All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to go grab a book. You can talk. Okay. <laughs> That, that was great. I missed a lot of great things, but it was great leading up to the point where I dropped out of the call. So I'm <laughs> glad to be back and hearing the great things again. So let's do some recommendations before we sign off. Okay, All right. Well, Brian, you want to go I, first? Yeah, I mean, I can. I, I'll have two because one is frivolous and the other isn't. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Both of these ones I'm choosing today are frivolous. Um, I'm making up for them uh, by cho choosing two at a time. Uh, the first is I'm going to affirm cheese curds. I mm -hmm. was just in the Midwest, and um, cheese curds are de delicious. They are bits of cheese that are breaded and then fried, and they're amazing. They're so delicious. What could go wrong? <laughs> they're heart disease, but um, <laughs> you know okay. that's years down the line. It was good in the moment. I, I was just on a trip out to Wisconsin and had a very good time. And cheese curds were among the food items that we consumed uh, while I was out <laughs> there. So cheese curds, very good. And the other one is a a movie, which I forget what year, but it's from the 2000s. Uh, it is called My Family and Other Animals. And it is about a British family. It, it's uh, their mother and five or six children. Uh, the mother is a widow. And they're just sitting around their very dreary England home while it's raining outside. And they're all just kind of sitting around doing nothing. And one of them, who's a very poetic and artistic older teen, stands up and goes, No, no, this won't do. We need sunshine. He goes, Well, where are you expecting us to go? There's no, there's no sunshine for miles around. He's like, Well, we need to go to Greece. To Greece. I have a friend out there who owns property. I'd be happy to... Uh, to you know host us well, we can't go to greece and the very next cut is them on a boat in greece <laughs> uh but the main character is uh one of the sons and he is a budding zoologist he actually ends up later in life becoming a zoologist so this is based on a real story oh neat and uh, it's just about their time on this little Greek island that I don't even remember the name of. Uh, and I feel really bad recommending this because I don't know where you can watch it. It's not on streaming <laughs> services. The DVD is like $80 on Amazon because of their weird <laughs> supply demand curve uh, calculation that they run. So Brian, really, I have a secret for you. Having fun isn't hard when you have a library card. Ooh. Start this beat. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, so you could try looking for it at the library. I, I, it's very possible they might have it. But anyway, that's my recommendation. It's a fun movie. Okay. Mine, The Black Book of Communism, subtitled Crimes, Terror, Repression. Uh, it is a thick book on the order of, no, oh, it's only a little over 800 pages long, by a number of authors, Black Book of Communism, and um, basically what it does is chart country by country mm. how many people communism has killed. Wow. And oh, the, it's, it's amazing and terrifying and frightening and horrible. Uh, and the, the ironic thing is that uh, it, it originated, I believe, in France. And there it, it was given a lot of uh, pushback. Because 
if you're attacking communism, obviously you're promoting fascism. <laughs> so you need to stop attacking communism because that promotes fascism and that won't do because we all know fascism is bad. And the authors have to kind of come up and say, well, we understand why you're saying that, but it's all right to talk about the bad things the left does too. Like, what kind of wimpy appalling? Anyway, <laughs> but aside from that little cur giving in a little bit to, to the flack, um, just for people who want numbers, dates, names, uh, this is not light reading. This is this is probably something you're going to use as a reference book. But if you're going to start getting into arguments with people who say, well, communism, you know, it had its problems and excesses, but no, no, there, there are no buts here. Here are the numbers. So Black Book of Communism. And the um, the editor, whose name is actually on it, I, I don't do French names, Stéphane Courtois. Translated by Jonathan Murphy and Mark Kramer, I'm sure. And Harvard University Press, of all people, published it. It's amazing in itself. Anyway, <laughs> that's why. Awesome. My recommendation is a novel that I read this weekend, which is True Grit by Charles Portis. Mm. I have not seen the John Wayne movie, which I realize is a... a Cardinal uh, Sin. A cardinal <laughs> sin. I was just going to say a flaw in my education, but okay. <laughs> Take it to the next level, Brian. I will. Um, but I have seen, I have seen the Coen brothers. Uh, yes, we film, saw that not which, long ago. Oh it man, isn't it beautiful? I, yeah. I just loved it. And reading the book was a very similar experience to watching the movie. So I feel like that's a sign of a really good film adaptation. So I yeah. recommend both the novel and the recent Coen Brothers adaptation. Okay. I'm going to recommend the original John Wayne version too, just okay. because I'm, I've already said it was a cardinal sin that you haven't seen it, so I should yeah. just double down here. Yeah. Well, now you've got three <laughs> recommendations. You've thrown the world yeah, out of balance. <laughs> I missed last week. I have to make up for it. Oh, that's true. That's true. Now you go. All right. Thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks Quips. also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Um, if you feel like finding us on Facebook, you can like our Facebook page. If you want to listen on YouTube, a lot of people listen to podcasts on YouTube, we're told. Um, we are there. You can subscribe to our channel. Um, you can also find us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, various and sundry places. Uh, if you like the show, drop us a review. We'd really appreciate that. And you can let us know what you think further by sending us an email. Our address is haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. Thank you so much. See you next week. <laughs>